good afternoon, everybody. And I'm talking to both the people in the building here. We've got a nice little crowd of folks who are braving the cold and the ice and the COVID to come for our in-person presentation. We know we have an extensive group of folks online. So welcome uh, near and far to our first program for the uh, 2022 season. My name is Al Walters and I'm the president of the Elgin History Museum. And we're glad you're here with us today. Uh, I'm noticing some new and different faces for this program amongst the people here in house. And that often happens when we step out of our, our normal lane and, and bring in a program that's a little different than our, our norm. Um, if I can, Paul, are you here? Can you help get some chairs out for these latecomers, please? And uh, so uh, it's always great that when we can expand our audience, both in person and online. So we, we thank you for uh, sitting in here or tuning in here. I'd uh, like to thank Paul Larson, our, our member Paul Larson. For those of you who are in the, uh, the room today, he is sharing his rather extensive Beatles memorabilia collection. And that's on the tables over here by the window. You're welcome to look at those when the uh, session is over. I'd like to talk about an upcoming program and that's our February program. Uh, knowing that uh, February is Black History Month and uh, March is Women's History Month, we, we kind of strike a chord with our February 20th program, uh, Sunday, February 20th at 2 p.m. Uh, here at the museum and online. Uh, the title of the program will be Significant Black Women of the Reconstruction Era and Beyond. The presenter will be the Reverend Dr. Felicia LeBoy, pastor at the First United Methodist Church here in Elgin. And her presentation will feature stories of amazing but perhaps unknown women and their accomplishments. That'll be at 2 p.m. on the 20th, and you'll certainly get communications from the museum about that. Now let's turn our attention to today's program, if we can. Uh, our presenter today is Dr. John F. Lyons, who was born in London, England. Uh, he lives in Chicago and works as a professor of history at the Joliet Junior College, where he teaches classes in British and US history. He's a noted public speaker and has spoken to audiences in the US and in Europe. His latest book is entitled, Joy and Fear, The Beatles, Chicago in the 1960s. It's his fifth book. And interestingly enough, that's the title of today's program, The Beatles, Chicago in the 1960s. Dr. Lyons. Thank you. Hey, uh, well, hello everybody. And uh, thank you very much for braving both the cold weather and uh, COVID to be here today. And uh, what I want to talk about really is, uh, I know I'm looking around this room now and I can see all of you are far too young to remember the 1960s. But what I want to try and get across to this crowd is about what it was like in the Chicago metropolitan area in the 60s when the Beatles arrived. And so that's really what I want to try and focus on uh, today. And uh, what I want to start with is to uh, say a little bit about uh, what makes the, the Beatles Chicago connection unique. You know, a lot of people know uh, about maybe New York's connection to the Beatles, that New York was the first city they came to. But there's a lot of uh, very unique connections between Chicago and the Beatles that I just want to spend a little uh, bit of time uh, talking about. And then uh, the name of the book that I wrote is called Joy and Fear. And it's called that because uh, the Beatles brought enormous joy to uh, pretty much everywhere they went, including in the Chicago metropolitan area. And I just want to give you again an idea about what it was like in Chicago when the Beatles arrived and the amount of joy that they brought to the area. But they also, uh, I think, brought fear. A lot of people were scared of the Beatles because they seemed to uh, ignite passions that uh, a lot of people... Uh, found uh, very troubling. And so I'm going to say a little bit about that uh, as well, about the, uh, the tales of fear. But the other thing I want to talk about is um, the local music scene. One of the things that the, uh, the Beatles ignited in uh, the Chicago area was a music scene that I think was one of the most uh, vibrant in the country. And in many ways, I don't think it's uh, a music scene that a lot of people outside Chicago know about, and certainly not in, uh, uh, in England. 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And that includes obviously Elgin as well. There's a music scene here, but also the other uh, areas of uh, Chicago, or metropolitan uh, Chicago. Okay, so uh, again, thanks for coming out, everybody. Those that are sitting at home, I hope you're comfortable and uh, nice and warm. Okay, now, what uh, you know, some of the sort of contributions of Chicago to the Beatles story. The first major one is that uh, the uh, the Beatles recorded their uh, music, obviously, in uh, England, and it was um, promoted. It was published by or released by uh, EMI Records uh, in England, and they had a subsidiary in the US, which was Capital. And you'd kind of think that Capital would have put out the first Beatles records in America, but they didn't. They didn't. Uh, they passed on the Beatles records because they knew that uh, British bands just were never successful in America. <laughs> anyway, so uh, in terms of, say, therefore, what happened is that a small African-American owned record label that was based in uh, downtown uh, Chicago ended up not putting out the, only the first Beatles single in America, but also uh, the first Beatles album. And the first Beatles single they put out was in February uh, 1963, and that was uh, Please Please Me. And then in January 64, they put out the first Beatles album in America, which was the uh, Introducing the Beatles. So if you've got copies of them, original copies, they're worth quite a bit of money nowadays, because uh, especially their singles, uh, VJ bought out two singles uh, of, uh, in, in 1963 of the Beatles, and uh, neither of them charted very well. And so therefore they are worth quite a bit of money. But anyway, so this is the building and this is in 1449 South Michigan Avenue, the, if, if any of you are familiar with that building. And it was left derelict for years. And uh, I, I, I visited the area uh, early last year now, 2021, and it's actually reopened. And it's reopened as a coffee house. So it's the same building, but it's actually reopened as a coffee house. And what they've done, which I was so pleased with, is they've actually uh, honoured the old VJ records. So you can see from these pictures here, at the, uh, the bottom there, they've got uh, uh, covers of, these are called albums, for anybody that's <laughs> too young to, to know what they were, albums, okay? And you can see a number of them up there. You know, some major uh, artists they had on there, Little Richard and, uh, you know, many, many others. But you can see the Beatles one down there in the bottom left-hand side. And then at the back, there's a picture of the owners, James Bracken and uh, Vivian uh, Carter, the two owners of uh, VJ. And you can see a big picture there at the back in the, uh, the coffee house. So anyway, I thought they did a very nice job. So if ever you, you're in downtown Chicago and you want a cup of coffee and you want to relive VJ records, that's the place to go. OK, now, uh, when VJ released their records, uh, they, they, they had connections with the biggest uh, top 40, anyway, radio station in Chicago, if not the Midwest, and that was uh, WLS. And so uh, we pretty much know that WLS was therefore the first uh, radio station to play the Beatles. They played uh, Please Please Me again in 19, February 1963. And uh, so therefore, again, another major connection with Chicago is they were the first, uh, WS, the first radio station to play the Beatles in America. And then also, the Beatles didn't break in America really until January 64. So it took quite a while, really. They were big in England, but really not in America. So they broke here in, in January 64. And again, one of the reasons why they broke is, again, because of WLS, because WLS had such a wide signal, such a large signal, that they were able to be heard all over the Midwest, up into Canada. So WLS played a major role in breaking the Beatles. And again, as far as we know, they were the first record, the first uh, radio station to play the Beatles. And the first DJ to play them was Dick Biondi. And uh, there's a documentary coming about or, or, uh, out about him uh, pretty soon, hopefully this year, that I'm really eagerly looking forward to, uh, to seeing. Now, there's another connection with uh, uh, Chicago, and that is uh, the Beatles uh, came to America for three summer tours in 64, 65, 66. And uh, bar New York, okay, the place that the Beatles uh, played in more than any other city in America was Chicago. So they played on each one of the tours. They played 64, 65, 66 in Chicago, and they played five concerts. They played uh, two concerts, uh, sorry, 
one concert in 64, 265, 266. So they played uh, more concerts in Chicago than they did in any other city bar in New York. Now we all know about Shea Stadium. They played in Shea Stadium in uh, 65 and the crowd there we think was about 56,000, something like that. And that's generally recognized as the largest crowd they played to in uh, North America at least. But what seems to never get noticed is that they played in uh, Chicago in 1965 and they played at White Sox Park and they played two concerts there. So they played an afternoon show and an evening show. And funnily enough, if you add up the attendance of the two shows, more people saw them on that day in Chicago than they did on any other day of any of their North American tours. So take that, New York. <laughs> but anyway, uh, now in terms of where else did they get a bigger crowd, we think probably uh, they played in uh, uh, the Philippines and they played in a football stadium there. So that was probably a bigger crowd. But besides that, I can't think of a bigger crowd than 62,000 that saw them in one day in uh, uh, the uh, in White Sox Park. And this is a picture shows you what it was like. They actually had this bandstand in the middle of the field. And so that was the kind of view you would get of, uh, I'm going to talk more about the concerts later, but it gives you an idea of what the sort of view people would get of uh, the Beatles. Okay, another connection with Chicago is in, uh, I think probably the most famous press conference they ever gave. I think without a doubt, maybe you could say the first one when they came to America in 64, but I think this is more famous. And that was when uh, John Lennon had to apologize for a remark he made about uh, the Beatles and Christianity. And that press conference took place in uh, Chicago. So probably the most famous press conference they ever undertook took place in Chicago, and that is August 1966. They actually had two press conferences on the same day. This shows you the second one. And you can see John Lennon there. He looks rather nervous to me. OK, another connection. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room has seen John and Yoko's experimental movies. Okay, so anyway, uh, John uh, uh, Lennon uh, had a relationship with and then married uh, Yoko Ono, a Japanese artist, and they made some experimental films together. And the first one they made was called Smile. And the first time that those films, their early experimental films, were shown in, in the world anywhere was at the Chicago International Film Festival. Yeah, so there you are, another connection. Do you want one more? Yeah, you're getting any. Ha. I always like to keep the crowd waiting so you yeah, can yeah. war, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so anyway, it gives you an idea. There was a lot of major connections between Chicago and uh, the Beatles that are very unique to uh, the Beatles story. Now, I just want to say a little bit about, uh, like I say, what it was like to be in Chicago when the Beatles arrived. And in terms of the Beatles arriving in uh, America, uh, like I say, they, they were very big in England in 1963. They already had uh, number one records. They already had number one albums, singles. They'd already appeared in front of the uh, Royal Family, which was a big event, and they played at the London Palladium, which is the major event. So they were pretty much household names in uh, England in, by the end of 1963, but not so in America. You know, I mentioned that they released records here in uh, February 63, but they never really were a success in 63 in America, which is really hard to believe. You can't imagine that happening today with social media, could you? You can't imagine there being a phenomena uh, in one part of the world, that another part of the world, especially America, wouldn't even know anything about. So it was quite amazing, really. But anyway, so uh, people in America that really didn't start to know about them really until early 63, maybe late, uh, sorry, early 64. But maybe late 63, maybe December, they started to get some airplay. But certainly January 63, they started to get a lot more. And uh, because of that, they came to America for the first time uh, in uh, February 1964. They arrived here on uh, February the 7th, 1964. And uh, they eventually played two concerts on that uh, visit, one in uh, Washington, D.C. and one in New York. But they also gave their first live TV appearance. And that was on a show called The Ed Sullivan Show. And I think, I, I, I think I'm right in saying this, there's no real equivalency today. I don't, I don't think you could really say that there's a similar sort of show. It was basically a prime time Sunday evening variety show that the whole family watched. 
And all the major stars would be on that show, you know, going back to Elvis Presley and so all the major stars, like Beach Boys, everybody you could think about was on that show. And they made an appearance on the show on February uh, the 9th, 1964. And uh, it was a sensation. I mean, there was so much hype leading up to it that uh, 73 million people watched the show. That for the time, that was a record. You think about it, a record TV audience see this unknown, relatively unknown British group appearing on the Ed Sullivan show on February 9th, 1964. And again, uh, it, I'll, I'll say a bit more about the impact of that show a little bit later, but there certainly, it was a phenomenal TV appearance. You know, uh, so many people loved them. And in terms of what happened in Chicago, uh, this is something that was replicated all over the country because one of the things about the Beatles is that uh, people became obsessed with their hair. That was pretty much, if you think about the Beatles, the first thing that comes to your mind in 1964 is hair, okay? And uh, people wanted the same haircut as them. The only slight problem is uh, if you want hair the length of the Beatles' hair, it took a long while to grow. Yeah, I know, it does. <laughs> and so anyway, so basically what happened was that people wanted, uh, they wanted to short circuit that. So what do you do if you want the Beatles' haircut on February the 10th, 1964? The obvious thing, you go out and buy a wig. And they did in the tens of thousands. It's hard to believe. And again, these figures, please tell me I'm not lying here, but this is from the Chicago Daily News. And uh, they talked about basically what happens after the Ed Sullivan show in downtown Chicago. And they said they are selling like hot cakes. The man who manufactures the wig is turning them out at the rate of 20,000 a day, a day. That can't be true. It's true. With orders for more than 300,000 wigs. Just unbelievable. And the other thing you notice about this picture is, do they look like youngsters? They really don't, do they? They look, shall we say, more middle-aged people. So you can imagine, you know, what this tells us about the sort of uh, the pandemonium that took place uh, in uh, February 1964 after the Beatles' uh, appearance on Ed Sullivan. Now, the other thing that happened is, now again, most of the uh, audience for the early Beatles, without a doubt, was girls. There's no question about that. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, if you look at the audiences at the concerts, if you look at the people that were buying the records, it was overwhelmingly teenage girls. It wasn't so much boys. Boys sort of saw them as being uh, a sort of girly thing. If that's, is, is that a phrase, girly? I think in the 60s, the phrase would be sissy. <laughs> But anyway, so, uh, so therefore, a lot of boys didn't like them, just saying. But uh, girls certainly did. And what they started to do is they started to form fan clubs all over America, all over the Chicago area, all over the suburbs. Some of these fan clubs were huge. I mean, literally thousands of members. They had uh, uh, secretaries. They had presidents. They had treasurers. You had to pay dues every uh, uh, month. They had newsletters. They used to have meetings. They used to celebrate the people's birthdays. It was just incredible things. But some of these uh, uh, fan clubs were just local ones that were based in a school or in the neighborhood or just a few friends that thought it was kind of fun to gather together and form a fan club. And this is just one that I found. This was a wonderfully named Beatles fan club called the National Association for the Advancement of Beatle People. There you go. Now, the other way that people got information about the Beatles, girls got information about the Beatles, were the teen magazines. And there was tons of these, again, that were in uh, America in the 60s. Uh, ones like 16 Magazine and Teen Life and, you know, tons of them. And uh, a lot of these magazines were, uh, were the place where you went if you wanted information about the latest news from the Beatles. Some of it was, uh, you know, what you call sort of romance stories about, you know, what sort of girls does uh, Paul like? And, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Have I got a chance of dating Paul McCartney? And uh, I couldn't answer that now. That people in the 60s actually thought they did, but they are. But anyway, so uh, and what they used to use is they also used to run a lot of uh, competitions in these magazines where you could win certain things. And some of these magazines like this one here, did I, I don't think I actually wrote which magazine it is, but it was, anyway, you can see it there. And uh, they ran this contest where uh, you can actually speak to the Beatles. And of course, we all know this is nonsense. It's never gonna happen, is it? <laughs> yes, it did. Because uh, I interviewed somebody called Pat Myers 
And if you're listening, Pat, hello. And uh, she was from Joliet. And uh, she entered one of these competitions, uh, never thinking, obviously, she was going to win and she'd never hear from the Beatles. But anyway, she tells the story. She was sitting down with her uh, uh, friends, you know, listening to Beatles records, her grandma and her mother. And there was a phone call and they said the Beatles are going to be on the line in half an hour. And they were. Unbelievable. Yes. All four Beatles. And this is the amazing thing. I don't know if you can actually see it from where you are. They stayed on the phone for 40 minutes. Haven't these people got something better to do, like make records? 40 <laughs> minutes are on the phone talking to these teenage girls in Joliet, uh, Illinois. It was just unbelievable. And of course, uh, the best bit is when she said, at the time, I had a Siamese cat I named George. I told George Harrison that I love my cat as if I was loving him. I don't remember his response, but I'm sure he thought I was crazy. Yes, he did. Uh, Pat, I'm sorry to tell you that. But, uh, but anyway, so yeah, and I also came across other uh, uh, newspaper articles that basically tell us similar stories. So the Beatles did actually follow up on some of these. Uh, other uh, ones, you would actually, uh, you know, win a ticket to one of their concerts and meet them. Uh, and surprisingly, quite a few people did actually meet them. You know, you'd be amazed really how many did. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, the other major event after the Ed Sullivan show in 1964 was when the first Beatles movie came out. And it was called uh, Hard Day's Night. And again, it, it premiered in downtown uh, Chicago. And... Uh, I, you know, again, I talked to quite a few people that went to the, uh, the, the, the first showing to the movie. And this is from somebody, again, I spoke to in Joliet. And, you can see, and that's the ticket that they gave. If you went to see the showing, that was a ticket. Isn't that a lovely ticket? Yeah? But you wish you had that there? That's the one. But anyways, and this uh, girl, again, teenage girl, she went to see the movie. It can only be described as a steering. Now, don't forget, this is a movie. It's on a silver screen. There's nobody there except for the girls, okay? and mostly girls, just imagine about three teenage girls screaming at the top of their lungs for no legitimate reason. It was a movie, so the Beatles couldn't hear us. I never actually heard anything in the theatre when watching the movie. I first heard the actual dialogue or storyline when the movie came out on TV. Most of them never even knew that it was a classic, great film. They didn't find out until they actually saw it on TV, maybe years later. But, uh, anyway... Um, now, the first time that the Beatles came to Chicago was in 64. Okay, that was their first uh, visit. But they never stayed overnight. They uh, came into the city and they were only here for about seven hours and they left. So the first time they actually stayed in Chicago was in 1965. And they spent two nights at this hotel, which is the uh, O'Hare. Uh, of course, it's up near O'Hare Airport, which is why it's called O'Hare Sahara Inn. The hotel's no longer there. There's another hotel in its place, but that hotel is gone. And the hotel was kind of like a, a really plush uh, hotel. I don't know if any, again, I know you're all too young to remember it, but it had a, you know, outdoor swimming pool, luxury swimming pool, had all the great entertainers played there. It was a really, you know, a very uh, plush uh, hotel. And the Beatles stayed there for two nights. And uh, the owners of the hotel made a tragic mistake. And the tragic mistake they made is they actually publicized the fact that the Beatles were staying at their hotel. Yeah, don't do this, okay? And they did. And so therefore what happened is hundreds of girls, again, mostly girls, but some boys, hundreds of teenagers, maybe I'd be better off saying, booked every room in the hotel. Yep. And then uh, they also knew when the Beatles were coming into town. They arrived in uh, Chicago in... Um, you know, for, the, for this visit in uh, about three or four o'clock in the morning from uh, playing in uh, Hoosler. And then they were driven to the uh, hotel. And when they got to the hotel, there was hundreds of teenagers waiting for them. So you could just imagine that the, uh, for the whole time they were there, they were there for two nights. They were basically living in what can only be described as a frat. We don't have them in England, but I believe you call them frat parties. Or is it sobriety parties? Again, I've never been to one, but you probably know what I'm talking about. And so that was basically uh, what they endured for two days at this hotel. And I was very lucky to, to uh, interview the daughter of uh, the general manager. And she was a, a, a member of a teenage fan club. And in, in April 65, uh, five, her dad said to her, I've got something to tell you, but I'll keep it a secret. It's a teenage girl. The Beatles are coming to our hotel. 
So, of course, she collapsed pretty obviously. And then uh, when she woke up, she said, really? And he said, yeah. So they did actually come to the hotel and she uh, persuaded her father to let her have a room opposite the Beatles. She stayed in a room opposite where the Beatles stayed. Now, again, I know there's young people in the audience here. So uh, the Beatles, should we say, uh, had a reputation. And uh, she told me about some of the events that she saw from that room. I'm not going to tell you. But anyway, so, uh, you know, but anyway, so she, that, that was the first time they stayed in Chicago. They stayed there for two days. Now, this is another story I just thought was so fascinating about what it was like in the 60s. And this is a group, uh, don't worry, there is a Chicago connection. I'm not just showing this, but this is a group that was originally called the Rondells. And uh, they were playing uh, sort of pop music in the uh, early 60s. And uh, they were spotted by a friend of Brian Epstein uh, called Norman Wise. You know, I think they were playing Atlantic City and he liked the group and he told Brian Epstein. And Brian Epstein uh, was the manager of the Beatles, but he was also manager of a few other groups. Anyway, he became their manager. So this group called the Rondells, he became their manager. And uh, he told the Beatles, obviously, and they didn't like the name Rondell. So they, they thought, well, what are we going to call them? And so it was John Lennon that came up with the name The Circle. That's what they were called. OK. And the person I spoke to was Earl Pickens. You can see him up there. And he played keyboards for the group. And he uh, was a medical student because he was only playing in this group, you know, and, and for fun. That's what the Rondells were. It was only just for fun. And uh, so he was at the University of Chicago. He was in their medical school, okay, training to be a doctor. In, uh, and he started there in 64. And then, like I say, in 65, they were spotted by uh, Brian Epstein's friend. And so their lives uh, changed uh, rapidly. And so what happened is they signed a recording contract. They bought out a record that was called, I think it was Red Rubber Balloon. Was it Red Rubber Ball? Red Rubber Ball. And it got to number two, I think, in uh, the Billboard chart in the summer of 1966. And uh, Brian Epstein said to uh, Earl Pickens and the rest of the group in the summer of 66, I want you to go on tour. And they were like, oh, fabulous, with the Beatles. <laughs> so they ended up going on the 1966 tour with the Beatles. Yeah. So he finished medical school in uh, May or June or whatever it was. In August, he's actually on tour with the Beatles playing all over America. I mean, just unbelievable. But uh, the thing about Earl was, and again, if you're listening, Earl, hello. Uh, the thing about Earl was he, uh, he did like medical school and he thought there's no future in this music. So he went back to the University of Chicago Medical School. He finished his training, quit the band, and he's now a surgeon in Florida. So if you're ever in Florida, and you, anyway, but uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I just thought it was an amazing, and there's so many of these. I mean, the, the, the stories of people, I also interviewed the people that, uh, you know, just uh, unbelievable stories that they ended up at Beatles press conferences. You know, they wrote some magazine and said, I want to go to a Beatles press conference. And the magazine said, yeah, sure. And they basically ended up at a press conference, you know, the Beatles. Uh, a lot of the times the Beatles were very friendly with their fans and a lot of people ended up basically uh, seeing them after shows and whatever, you know, but anyway, there's a lot of amazing stories about uh, the Beatles. And it's just, uh, there's another one I want to tell you because I'm sure most of you know about who the Beach Boys are. They're nodding, they don't know who they are. <laughs> you do not. But anyway, okay, in terms of the Beach Boys, and uh, they'd met the Beatles in, I think it was 65 when they first met the Beatles. So they were kind of relatively friendly with them. And when the Beatles played in Chicago in 1966, okay, so they played uh, in uh, the International Amphitheater in 66, the, uh, the Beach Boys were playing on the same night in Springfield, Illinois. Yeah, so they were playing in Springfield and the Beatles had just come in. Their first uh, night of the tour was in Chicago. And so they, they uh, came up with a great idea. Why don't we surprise the Beatles? What a great idea. So two of them, and the two are... Bruce Johnson, which is the one on the left there, and then Mike Love, the one on the right. And uh, they decided to uh, uh, charter a plane and uh, fly to Chicago. So after their concert in Springfield, uh, they chartered the plane. They arrived in Chicago at about one o'clock in the morning, okay? And then they got a cab to the Astor Tower Hotel where the Beatles were staying. And of course, what greeted them when they arrived at the hotel? 
No, the Beatles are in bed. The Beatles had gone to bed. Can you believe this? So they were outraged and uh, they actually ended up waking the Beatles up. They did wake them up. And they said that they, the, the Beatles are the most boring people that they'd met. They would not party. Now don't forget, these people just got off a plane. You know, they'd just played two concerts. They'd just been through the Lenin Bigger Than Jesus controversy. No wonder they were tired. They just wanted to go to bed. But the two Californian beach boys wanted to party all night. And so uh, they came up with a great idea. And the great idea, we'll play them our newest song, okay? One that hadn't been recorded yet, but Bruce, uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, uh, Beach Boys had just basically uh, decided to uh, produce as a record. And that was called Good Vibrations. And so they played the record on the piano in the hotel room. And guess what the Beatles said? Very nice, but we're going back to bed. <laughs> and so they, that's what they said then. The, a reporter who organized a trip for them uh, interviewed them afterwards. And they said the Beatles were a drag. They don't know how to party at all. It must have been the seventh day for them. All they wanted to do was rest. So there you are. So much for the Beatles' reputation. It's now gone after this talk here. Okay, now again, I know all of you are far too young, but uh, one of the things that the, uh, the Beatles ignited was uh, a music scene, not only in Chicago, but I think, you know, in different parts of America. And uh, the reason for that is that Again, hard to imagine today, but, you know, if you look at the Beatles on that Ed Sullivan show, you can still see the film of it, you know, it's readily available online or whatever. And a lot of young people sat down and watched that show. And what they saw was something that looked amazingly fun. I mean, the, the, the Beatles were smiling, they were laughing, they looked like they were really enjoying themselves. And if you're a teenage boy watching that, there was something else you noticed. And that was hundreds of teenage girls screaming at them. And they thought, I'm having some of this. So basically what happened is a lot of boys decided, why don't we form bands and be like the Beatles? They look like just a, a gang of friends. And also it's so easy what they were doing. You know, anybody could do that. They just get up there, they strike a few chords, girls scream, anybody could do it. So basically what happened is that people rushed out to buy instruments. And again, if you look at these statistics, there was already a lot of people buying guitars, but uh, a lot of that was the... Um, acoustic guitars, because there was a folk uh, revival that was taking place in the early 60s. And that did encourage a lot of people to buy uh, guitars. But again, if you look at the numbers, you can see how quickly they go up after the uh, uh, Ed Sullivan show, February 64. And uh, 1964, Americans spent 27 million on drum kits. In 65, the figure almost doubled to 50. And again, there's one person to thank for that is Ringo Starr. Again, he made it look so much fun. And you can actually see him. You know, if you look at that film from the uh, Ed Sullivan show, he was basically very visible at the back. In a lot of bands, what they used to, uh, all you'd see is the lead singer and the, 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 uh, the rest of the group was basically just sort of slung away at the back. But they were all very individualistic. And he was seen there on show. And also, again, another Chicago connection is that the drums he had was by uh, Ludwig. And that is a Chicago-based company. So again, I, I you know... I, I could say quite a bit about that, but basically uh, the owners of their, uh, uh, of the company of Ludwig, uh, they all funnily enough in 1965 bought mansions and uh, they called them the house that Ringo built. Yeah, so thank Ringo for that. But anyway, but this is the, the one I, I got from Billboard and I even find that hard to believe, that last quote, okay? I'll, I'll read it for you youngsters probably can't read, but uh, this surpassed the dollar volume. This, they, they talked about the, the amount of money spent on instruments. This surpassed the dollar volume for record sales. It was great at the combined dollar volumes of all spectator sports, still and movie cameras, comic books, playing cards, instruments also outsold the entire hobby industry. I find that hard to believe. I think that's hype. Surely, please tell me. But maybe it's true. But we do know that basically uh, groups started up all over America and all over the Chicago area, many of them to copy the Beatles. Or I should say they were inspired by the Beatles. The only slight problem is that when they started to then try and emulate the Beatles, they kind of found out that actually it wasn't that easy, that uh, the chord structures were pretty complicated. They had harmonies that were very sophisticated 
and they couldn't really replicate the Beatles. Some of them tried and done very well, but, but luckily enough, that summer of 64, there was a bunch of long-haired hoodlums coming into America from Britain. And at the forefront of them was groups uh, like the Rolling Stones, the Yardbirds, and uh, well, Dave Clark Five to a degree, but uh, uh, the Kinks, those sort of groups. And the music they were playing, it looked more doable. It, you know, again, I don't want to say it was easier to do, but it was certainly more doable than what the Beatles were doing. So therefore, a lot of the groups that started a band because of the Beatles, the music they played was much more like what the Rolling Stones, the Yardbirds, the Kings played than the Beatles. I think that would be a fair comment. Not all of them, but I'll, I'll mention it in a minute. But anyway, in terms of in Chicago, so people started forming groups and playing in basements and garages. Then they started to move to parties, you know, so they started to work their way up. And uh, in terms of these groups, the first one of them to have a hit record uh, on the Billboard charts was uh, this group here. And I'm sure most of you know uh, The Shadows of Night and uh, the, the hit record. And this was, this, this was early 66. So it does take a while for groups to get formed, get record contracts, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, that was the first ones to break into uh, uh, the national charts, not the local charts from uh, Chicago. And again, if, if most of you probably know their music, or some of you do, and it is very influenced by, I think, uh, Chicago blues music and certainly the Rolling Stones, I think without a doubt, really. Uh, the first of the Chicago groups to uh, have a number one record out of these groups that came out of the, uh, the Beatles uh, was uh, the Buckinghams. And again, I think they're a little bit more like the Beatles. They're, 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 again, they played different types of music. But, and, uh, you know, again, that was the, the, the song was kind of a drag. And that was number one in 1967. But the thing about the Beatles is that uh, they not only uh, inspired boys. I mean, the, the music industry at the time in the early 60s was it was an industry where uh, males produced the music and females consumed it. Like I was saying, most of the fans were female and most of the bands were uh, male. And really, I mean, maybe I could even ask this audience here, the, the thousands that are in this room that those at home can't see, that uh, the, uh, you know, can anybody even think of an all-female instrumental band? I don't mean singing band, or I don't mean where one plays one instrument. I mean, the whole group was a female instrumental band before the Beatles because I find it hard to think of one. You know, it was that unusual. Now, after the Beatles, there was a number of them. There was a lot of all-female bands, many of them coming out of Chicago. This is just one of them, which is called the Daughters of Eve. And uh, the reason I got to put them up there is because they come from where I uh, live at the moment. They come from Rogers Park. So I thought I should at least put them up there. But also I'm putting them up there because my 14-year-old daughter, one day I, I was actually playing one of their songs called Hey Lover, and my 14 year old daughter came in and she said, Dad, that's on TikTok. <laughs> so they are, that's how they know a lot of these songs in the 60s. They, they actually have a hit, well, not a hit, but they did pretty well because of uh, TikTok was uh, playing their songs. But anyway, now the point is why? Why is it that so many girls started to pick up instruments, form bands that had never done before? And I think it was because the Beatles were very, I don't want to use the word feminist, I don't think that's the right word, but they, they had sort of feminine characteristics that appealed to girls, not only as fans, but also that it made many girls think that they also could do that. And again, if you listen to the Beatles uh, music, they do have those sort of harmonies that they learned from girl groups. You know, there is a sort of the Ronettes, all them sort of female singing groups. They, they did love all them and they incorporated it into their music. And also if you look at the Beatles, they're, they do look kind of androgynous, you know, the long hair, they're all kind of like, I don't want to use the word, but the, 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 what do you say, scrawny, S slim? They're not exactly macho looking, are they? Let's be honest. They, they kind of look like boys, you know, in many ways. And so, uh, so I think that the girls could basically relate to them. You know, they could see that they could do that because they looked similar to what they would do in a band. And also uh, a lot of the Beatles' uh, lyrics were very much directed at girls. If you look at all their early ones, they were very girl-centered sort of uh, songs. So because of that, I think a lot of girls thought we could do that as well when they saw the Ed Sullivan show. And that was uh, one of the ones that uh, came out. And again, there was many, many others all over Chicago uh, that came out after the, uh, the Beatles. Now I know what you're all saying, I can hear you at the back saying, what about Elgin? 
Yeah. Elgin's finest. Now, somebody made a joke about this, not me, but somebody asked, what are they running away from? And they said, Elgin. I, it's not true. I mean, it's, <laughs> don't believe it, okay? But anyway, in terms of this band, I believe they only bought out one record. I think this is the only one on a local record label which is called Dunnage, which is a very popular local record label that, you know, recorded a lot of the, the music from Chicago. And uh, they bought out this record, and it's called Project Blue. And it is part of that sort of garage rock that came to America after the Beatles invasion. There's a sort of product really of the, 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 the British invasion, I should say. And uh, it is a unique record even. I mean, I do think it's uh, pretty much a 60s classic because uh, it does sound different to a lot of the other 60s songs. It was much more abrasive and more sort of psychedelic uh, song. And uh, would you like to hear it? I thought you were gonna say no. And then I thought, what am I gonna do? Sit down, no dancing. Mm -hmm. It's worth a fortune now because so many, so few of them were sold at the time. It's pretty obviously on a small record label that to get a copy now, you know, costs a lot of money. But it's available on a lot of compilations. If you get the 60s compilations, you can see it uh, included on that. But anyway, that, that's El So there was bands everywhere. Elgin, this is their finest. Now, what about uh, places to play? Because that, that was also a problem uh, because... Um, there was a lot of groups opening up and they could play at parties, maybe restaurants, you know, that sort of thing. But there was very few venues that they could uh, play in. OK. And so therefore, uh, it took a while again for this to sort of develop in the Chicago area. And it mostly developed in the suburbs. I think that would be a true statement. There was teen clubs in uh, Chicago, but there was a lot in the suburbs that, were, you know, uh, and again, it's because a lot of uh, young people had moved out to the suburbs, so there was a big audience for it. But anyway, uh, there was a number of them, you know, all over. But this is probably one of the ones I think was probably the most iconic. Can we use that word, iconic? And it's by, uh, th these are the two people that opened the club, Paul, Paul Sampson and uh, uh, Tom Johnson. And, uh, you know, they watched the Ed Sullivan show, and they were in their late 20s. They were the wrong audience. They weren't that overly impressed. You know, it was like, yeah come on, bunch of long haired, you know, creeps. But they, you know, they saw that maybe there's some sort of potential here. And Paul Sampson uh, ran a, a record store in uh, Arlington uh, Heights. And people started to come in and ask for Beatles records also. But also people started to come in and they started to tell him about all these groups that were uh, starting up in the local area, you know? And so therefore uh, he came up with a great idea. And that is why don't I start my own club in uh, Arlington Heights? And it's going to be like The Cavern. The Cavern was the club that the Beatles performed in in Liverpool before they became big. And uh, the club that uh, Paul Sampson uh, 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 organised then became known as The Cellar. Do you get it? The Cavern? Mm -hmm. Cellar? Yeah. And uh, that opened up early 65 in uh, Arlington Heights. It then moved the following year because it was too small, the original uh, building. But it was an amazing success. All of these local bands that I talked about played there. But who else played? And don't forget, I mean, again, no offence to anybody from Arlington Heights, but sleepy would be a word we could use to describe it. Not exactly the cutting edge of rock music in the 60s, you would kind of guess. But have a look. How many people, or how many bands, sorry, well-known bands played at this place, the cellar, in the 60s? Look. 
don't give it away. I'm just trying to, yeah. I don't want, and nobody's shouting out in this crowd. We don't want that kind of, anyway, yeah, these, look at that. I feel like walking away. People over there are saying who? But yeah, basically, yeah, the who. I mean, that is unbelievable, isn't it? Isn't that incredible that they all played there? The birds, Buffalo Springfield, the who? I mean, really next, and uh, I got another little story for you is that uh, allegedly Paul Sampson was offered the Rolling Stones. Yep. And uh, allegedly he turned them down because he said they were going to be a bit too raucous for Arlington Heights. <laughs> so instead he picked the birds. If you read about the birds, Anyway, so uh, anyway, so he could have had the Rolling Stones, but he had the Who, the young, Jim Morrison, Jeff Beck. They all played there. Eric Clapton. I mean, it's quite unbelievable, really, that uh, the sort of groups that played there. And this is a local group. Yeah. Does anybody know who that group is? Yeah, I do. Nobody. I do. Okay, nobody knows here. Okay. Go on then. Who is it? But aren't they just a group that sort of disappeared and we're never going to hear from them again, Linda? Are you going to hear? Yeah, they're getting back together. Yeah, and this is a picture from inside. So you can see the club. It was, it was quite. And again, the building is still there, isn't it? The the, the if you go to the, I'm in the second one. If you go there, you can actually see the building. I think it's like an auto shop now, but the building is really there. You can actually see it. You know, you can just imagine the sort of uh, the who gang in there. And by all accounts, um, when uh, Pete Townsend was doing his guitar you know, windmilling sort of stuff. He got it stuck in the uh, the nets on the, uh, the roof. But anyway, so uh, unlucky for some. And again, I know what you're saying. What about Elgin? Okay. Now, in terms of in Elgin, there was a, uh, a ballroom here, okay, that was called the, uh, you can see it there, the Blue Moon. Again, it doesn't look that salubrious from the outside, does it really? Let's be honest. But inside, by all accounts, it was. And uh, again, a lot of the local bands played there. I believe Sticks. Paul, do you want to tell us any others? Yeah. So, so there's quite a few well-known ones, but certainly ones from, uh, uh, again, from uh, the local area. And then not that far from here is the uh, the Jaguar in St. Charles. And again, if you look at some of the groups, and again, look at who's there, the who. I mean, unbelievable, really, that they're playing in these places. And then this is another place that is in Algonquin, which was called the New Place. And again, a lot of the major acts also played uh, uh, there as well. So again, if you were a teenager in the 1960s in the Chicago area, it must have been just incredible the amount of music that you could hear. You know, not only on the radio station, WLS, you know, you could hear everything on there, but also from uh, local record shops, these teen clubs. I mean, it just would have been a, such a, you know, a, a really joyful sort of period. Uh, it's just a shame that all of you are too young to remember it, but uh, that's the, okay. Now, in anything in life, some people are skeptical, yeah? And some people thought the Beatles were not bringing joy. They were bringing horrible things like, well, I won't even mention it, it's so horrible, but they were bringing horrible things. And uh, so basically, there was a lot of opposition to the Beatles, which we can't, you can't imagine it now. If you see Paul McCartney, or I should say, Sir Paul McCartney, you know, and he looks so cuddly, doesn't he? You know, you kind of think, well, why would they be like this, dislike this man? Or you look at Ringo Starr and he flashes his V sign and he says peace and love and all that. And you kind of think, oh, he's so cuddly. In the 1960s, a lot of people didn't think the Beatles were cuddly at all. Uh, or some people thought that they uh, they certainly looked like animals, but they were not cuddly animals. And this is uh, the Chicago Tribune who constantly disliked the Beatles in the 60s. And the first uh, editorial, that uh, he was the editor, uh, W.D. Maxwell of the Tribune in the 60s, he had the first uh, editorial about them in January 64. So even before they're on the Ed Sullivan show, where he, 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 uh, the headline, if I remember right, it was Beatle Menace. And he was warning the public about the coming of the Beatles. So that was in 63, uh, sorry, January 64. And then when they appeared on the uh, Ed Sullivan show, he had another editorial about them. And in that one, which was published on February 11, so that would be two days after their appearance, this is what the headline was. And this is what he said about them. He described them as human sheepdogs. The Beatles, England's gift to the Bobby, have made their debut, et cetera. 
They make enough noise to bring the plaster down from the ceiling, but the teenagers respond in howling in ecstasy. So in terms of criticism, some of it was about their music, which they just couldn't understand. Some of it was about the reaction of the audience, especially the girls. They were very worried about uh, that the girls seemed to be very, shall we say, sensual in their uh, love of the Beatles. And uh, they were also very uh, worried that the America was moving in the one, wrong direction. You know, you now had boys who were looking like girls, you know. And so there was a lot of sort of people that were beginning to get worried about uh, what the Beatles symbolized. And another group that was worried about them in Chicago is the Catholic Church. But you know, the, the Chicago was a major diocese in the 60s, second uh, largest in uh, uh, America. And uh, priests used to have uh, their own um, columns in local newspapers, which is uh, quite unbelievable, really. And uh, this is, you can follow him. He's a very interesting uh, priest, uh, Reverend Clarence Brisset. He wrote a lot of columns about the Beatles. I just picked out this one because it gives you an idea. It's a kind of, it's a bit, it's got a lot of racial overtones in it as well, which, uh, which also a lot of them did. But the bit I'm just picking out is for teenagers, the painted medicine men become English Beatles, driving hysterical mobs into a frenzy of swooning emotion and just listen to the music. Yes, listen, the steady rhythm of the tom-tom, the foolish repetition of the same words, such as, I hold your hand. <laughs> so he was no fan of the Beatles. And like I say, I could have picked out any one of his columns because he constantly wrote about the, uh, the problem of the Beatles. So you had the tribunes very much against them. You had the, uh, the Catholic Church was certainly worried that they were turning teenagers away from the church towards other central matters. And then the politicians, yeah. And uh, this is Mayor Richard J. Daly. And he became the mayor of Chicago in 1955. He died in office in 76. And uh, if he hadn't died in office in 76, he'd still be the mayor of Chicago today. <laughs> so anyway, in terms of uh, Daly, he was worried about law and order. He had a lot of worries. I mean, let's be honest, he was a White Sox fan. So he had a lot of worries. Yeah. And uh, he basically was more interested in sort of uh, Irish music than uh, the Beatles. He had no interest in their music. He's obviously not their generation. But he was worried about uh, law and order. And he had a lot of issues that were taking place in Chicago at that time. The civil rights movement was uh, in full uh, throw in uh, uh, the northern states. And uh, in 63, there was a number of school boycotts where people, uh, uh, students actually walked out of the classrooms uh, because of uh, segregated, uh, in, in unequal schooling. So he had a lot of issues and also riots uh, uh, in uh, nearby uh, areas. And so what happened is uh, when the Beatles came to Chicago in 64, they came here for the first time, like I say, in September 64, uh, he was very worried. And he became even more worried when he started reading the local newspaper or the national newspapers from the previous stops on their tour. Because it seemed that on every stop on their tour, there seemed to be riots everywhere they appeared. There seemed to be thousands of screaming girls going nuts over them. And so he didn't want this in his city. So he came up with a great idea. And the first one was they're not going to stay in Chicago. So they never stayed in Chicago in 64. They came in and then they left. But that wasn't uh, that didn't solve all the problems because, of course, they could come to the airport to see them. So he decided another great idea. We're going to keep it uh, secret of when and where they come into Chicago. So he didn't want to tell anybody. The only problem was that the promoter's uh, press uh, secretary actually released the information and said that they were coming into Chicago at four o'clock at uh, O'Hare Airport. So to avoid that problem, Mayor, they decided at the last minute to switch the airport they came into. So that's why they eventually came into Midway Airport and they came into a remote field in the middle of nowhere. And still there was a lot of uh, uh, teenagers to greet them, but nowhere near as many as there would have been if they'd come to uh, Chicago. And so basically they came to Chicago, they arrived about 4.30 or so, and then they left by, uh, they'd already got on the plane and left Chicago by 11.30. So in other words, they'd done a press conference, they'd played in Chicago, they'd get driven to the airport and they'd already left seven hours. That's all they spent in Chicago on that first trip. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, that's me at Daily. So um, this was his spokesperson for the visit. And again, if you look at, you just have to look at him, don't you? Really, Jack Riley does not look like a Beatles fan. 
I mean, no offence to him, but he really doesn't. And uh, he was the one that used to basically uh, respond to letters. Whenever people used to write to the mayor, he was the one that used to basically respond to them, not the mayor was too busy. And a lot of Beatles fans wrote to the mayor asking the mayor to put on the Beatles show because the Mayor Daly was so powerful. They thought it was actually, you know, they'd write to him to put the Beatles on rather than promoters. And also uh, they wrote to him for tickets. They wrote to him to meet the Beatles. You know, the piles of letters were written to Mayor Daly by Beatles fans. Anyway, this was his response to one of them. This is, like I say, the spokesperson of uh, Chicago for the Beatles visit. Please believe me, the Beatles will come to Chicago and the Beatles will leave the next day. The world will not change one bit because their appearance here and their departure. A year from now, some other entertainer will occupy the spotlight and you will be wondering who were the Beatles? Faintly remembering you had heard that name somewhere. Look, we all make mistakes. You know, <laughs> come on, don't hold it against him. Okay, now again, this is a topic that, uh, you know, you can obviously see by looking at me that I lost, but it's the Great Hair Wars. And uh, the, I, I can't think of one thing that divided people in Chicago, in America, in the 60s than hair. Hair really said a lot, what sort of hair you had, what style, and especially how long it was. And the thing was that a lot of these, in, uh, hair was already growing in England. I don't know if that sounds right, but anyway, before the Beatles came to America. So a lot of the Beatles group, uh, British groups that came to America, British musicians, had already had longer hair than uh, people in America had. And so this was a musician, his name was Pete Shelton. And uh, he was actually in a, in a group that was called the Robin Hoods. And they played at the, uh, the Whiskey Go-Go in uh, Chicago. And uh, I'm gonna show you how long his hair was, okay? This is Pete here. Outrage? You should be. <laughs> but anyway, and uh, this, I mean, it was just unbelievable, the amount of opposition to people. Long. He said, I met a singer, a girl singer, and I took her out to dinner. We went to Mr. Kelly's on Rush Street, the English musician, Pete Shelley. Came, anyway, I had a guy come over to the table and he said to me, are you a boy or are you a girl? Now, that was a common phrase that was directed at boys of long hair. Are you a boy or are you a girl? I just said to him, kiss me and see. Wrong thing to say, Pete. Don't say that, but he said it. And uh, he went berserk. I thought he was going to trash the place. He turned tables over and he went bananas. Everywhere we went, we used to get into trouble because of the hair. Okay, now the, the, the Beatles um, had uh, sort of changed as people by about 1966. They were becoming more outspoken. And, uh, you know, I think there was a lot more people that were becoming uh, disillusioned with uh, the Beatles. And one of the things that uh, sort of uh, signifies that is the 1966 tour. So they toured in 64, 65, and then the last one was 66, summer of 66. And uh, just before that tour, uh, John Lennon gave an interview to an English uh, London newspaper and he talked about how Christianity in England was declining, which was true. I mean, if you look at all statistics, people were going to church less in England in the 60s. And he made that point. And he was saying now that teenagers basically like the Beatles more than uh, Christianity or more than Jesus. So it became known as the bigger than Jesus story. Okay? And it was printed then in a magazine called Datebook, which was uh, a, a teen magazine from uh, New York. And uh, the, the, the interesting thing about it is, if you look at this uh, cover, look who's on the cover. It's not John Lennon. And a matter of fact, let's be honest, most covers, if they had to choose one of the Beatles on there, they'd go for Paul. Paul was cute. He was. Come on. And uh, so they went with Paul. And they, not only that, they went with his quote from an interview. So he's on the front page, and his quote is what leads. And it's about race relations in America, basically. And uh, funnily enough, though, two disc jockeys in Alabama didn't pick up on Paul McCartney's quote. They picked up on the second one, which was John Lennon's about uh, religion. And uh, that was then picked up by radio stations. It was then picked up by uh, church groups, uh, newspapers. And if you look at sort of no local newspapers in the summer of 1966, there was uh, banning of Beatles records from radio stations. There was uh, fires of Beatles memorabilia. Paul, you better put yours away in case anybody 
wanted to try and blow them up. But anyway, and so there was a lot of, uh, you know, enormous opposition to uh, what Lenin had said. And so when he came to Chicago, he uh, had a press conference, which I mentioned earlier, where he had to basically apologize for his uh, statement. But I think it's indicative that in 66, the tour never sold out. On a, many of the venues, as a matter of fact, I think most of them, they never sold out in 66. And in Chicago, the promoter did announce that they'd sold out. They had two shows in uh, Chicago in 66 at the International Amphitheater, which held 26,000 people. Now that's half or less than half of what they played to a year earlier. So they were even knowing that it was going to be smaller. But funnily enough, them shows also, I don't think they really did sell out. And one of the ways I know that is because if you look at local newspapers before the concert, there was already advertisements two or three days before the concert selling tickets. So it gives you an idea that they were struggling. And also this is an advert from a major store, Polk uh, Brothers. And you can see that they had 2000 tickets that they were giving away with these. Uh, they were reducing the prices from I think it's 475. And that again was only a week before the concert. And also I spoke to somebody who was a philanthropist and he was somebody who basically bought tickets from the, uh, 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 the uh, promoter and then he was gonna sell them and with the profits, he was gonna uh, give them to a hospital. So he had good, uh, he couldn't sell the tickets. He said at the end, he basically was virtually giving them away because nobody would buy them. So it, it did have an effect in Chicago and all, all over America, the, uh, uh, the bigger than Jesus, uh, controversy. And I know, uh, you know, I've been talking far too long, so I'll just very briefly say a couple of last things. And that is that uh, I think by the late 60s, they stopped touring in 66, the Beatles. Uh, and also there was um, a lot of other groups that were coming to the fore in the late 60s. There was uh, now a new sort of generation that wanted these big festivals like Monterey and uh, Woodstock that the Beatles never played at. And uh, the Beatles were now sort of interested in things uh, that people just found so wacky, you know, something like LSD and something else called meditation. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it, but anyway, it was supposed to be popular. And they were getting interested in Hindu religion and they just seemed to be getting out of touch uh, with the general public. So I think by the late 60s, you know, the Beatle mania was no longer what it was. I know it sounds strange to say that because they were still selling records. But I think that they, they alienated a lot of people that liked them in 64. And if you look at this picture, this shows you how quickly they changed. I mean, really, to me, these pictures sum up the 60s. This is the Beatles in August 63. That's the mop top era, okay? This was only, what's that, six years later? Look at that. Long haired creeps. <laughs> hippies, that's what they were, a bunch of hippies. And so that sort of like indicates really how things have changed so quickly in uh, the 60s. And so therefore the fear that I talked about, I think had become pro more prominent in the late 60s than maybe the joy that had been there earlier. Uh, no. I didn't need that. I mean, I wasn't begging for your applause. Anyway, uh, I do uh, post quite a lot on, uh, if you've heard of this thing called social media. Uh, you haven't heard of it? Okay, well, it's, it's basically up in the air sort of stuff that the people put out there. Anyway, and uh, if you want to follow me on any of them, I do put a lot about the Beatles and about Chicago. And uh, otherwise, uh, I don't know how much time we've got left, Trish, but is there a chance that we could have some questions? Yeah, absolutely. We do? Yeah. Great. And so, yeah, if you've got any questions about anything, I don't mind, uh, uh, I probably won't be able to answer, but at least I can find somebody in this room that will be able to answer uh, for me. But yeah, if anybody's got any questions about anything, I'm quite happy to, to answer. Okay, we've got one question over here. My mother showed me a Life Magazine article, and I think it was mid 1963. I can't find that magazine, but I'm sure it existed. It showed a picture of the Beatles on stage with a bunch of girls in front. And she said, look at this band. They're called the Beatles. And the girls scream and yell, marry me, marry me. 
That's the first I've ever heard of it. I think it was mid-63. Okay. Is that, that, is, is that right? Right. You know, people's memories, they kind of, you know, the, what you remember is not always, and you're certain you remember it. But they start to appear in American newspaper magazines from November 63. And the reason why that happened is because that, that was when they got enormous publicity in England because they played in front of the Queen in November 63. Uh, three and because of that the American newspapers picked up on them and they started having uh, uh, articles about them in November to December 63 and of course what happened of course is Kennedy was assassinated so just as they were sort of like taking off in November 63 they disappeared from the media and then they came back at sort of like end of, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm virtually certain that probably would have been November December they were in Life magazine though you are absolutely right at that sort of stage. But I, I don't, the only time I've ever seen them mentioned uh, earlier than that is in a couple of Canadian newspapers because the, all their records were released in Canada. They, did, they were at the forefront. If any Canadians are watching, you were there first. And uh, so you do sit there. And also there was uh, the odd, odd article in local newspapers in, in uh, America because uh, the communist world was very um, interested and worried about the Beatles. And so you do see one small uh, along the lines of communist Russia condemns English long haired group, that sort of, but not much. There was a little bit, but most of the coverage is November to December 63. That's really when they start to appear in the newspapers. Yeah, have a look, see if you can. I mean, I could be wrong, but I, uh, as far as I know, six, November, six, uh, December would be. Yeah. And I know that Paul's got a few life magazines from a little bit later, isn't it? But uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, they certainly, uh, they're all, oh, the other thing I was going to say is uh, all the articles that appeared in the American newspapers in 63 about the Beatles were generally about the audience, the audience reaction. That was it, because they couldn't, but these people are English. English people are supposed to be quiet, staid, boring. And here they were, there's no need for that. I agree with me. I'm just saying that's what they're supposed to be like. And uh, so therefore, uh, when they started the thousands of screaming girls going nuts, that is what made the news rather than the music. Nobody talked about the music for months. You know, no people, nobody had any interest in music, really, in newspapers. But anyway, yeah. OK, yeah, I, I did actually. Yeah, OK, the, the, what you talk about is Get Back was a, was a documentary that was shown on, uh, I think it was Apple TV over... Uh, uh, Thanksgiving, it was, uh, and then you can still see it now, can't you? Anyway, was it uh, Netflix? Yeah, and basically, wasn't it Disney? Yeah, and anyway, in terms of uh, uh, the documentary, it was basically they they uh, produced a lot of film in uh, January 1969 of the Beatles making a record, and that record eventually became Let It Be, which was released uh, uh, in 1970 after the Beatles broke up. And uh, they also made a film at the time uh, that, again, didn't come out until about a year later, which was called Let It Be. And a lot of people thought that that film uh, was too dour, that he had sort of like 50 hours or more of film, not just audio, but film of them. And he picked ones that made it look more sort of uh, dour because they were breaking up than joyful. So therefore, Peter Jackson, who was the, the one uh, the New Zealand uh, filmmaker, made many major films, he had a look at the film again, and he thinks that he came up with a different view. And that is one that, yes, they had their troubles and there were some disagreements, but there was also a lot of uh, very interesting and joyful moments during these recordings. In terms of, uh, I did an experiment. I watched, there were six of us watched it, two teenagers, two Generation Xs and two Boomers. I'm not going to tell you which I fit into. Add the three. But anyway, and in terms of that, the two teenagers walked out the room after 30 minutes. And the last words they said were, they're not that cute anyway. And then the two Generation Xs, one of them started looking at their phone after about an hour. The other one sort of toughed it out. The two Boomers liked it. So what does that tell me? I think, uh, I'm not sure it will introduce a new audience to the Beatles to be honest. Who's going to sit through six to seven hours of uh, a few uh, uh, blokes of long hair uh, making music and talking about uh, uh, just everyday events in the 60s? And the answer is us in this room. But in terms of other people, I'm sceptical that it would have a wider audience than people really liked. Did you see it? I haven't seen it yet. 
Yeah, I, I recommend it. I liked it. I mean, if you if you have interest in the Beatles, it's definitely worth watching. Oh, they, the last time they played was August 66, January 69. Yeah, so they never played in front of a lot. The only thing they saw, you probably know is at the end of making the, the, the music, they appeared on top of the, the roof of the Apple. Yeah. And so, you know, it's not really a live performance. Well, it is a live performance, but not in front of a paying crowd. But that was it. But they were thinking about doing all different uh, places to play. They were thinking about playing in Africa. They were going to play in London. They're all thinking of uh, different wild ideas about where they could play a concert. But at the end of the day, there was no real, you know, for them to go on tour, they just had bad memories, really, of 66 and the other tours that they really didn't want to do it. I don't think there's any. Yeah, Paul McCartney is the only one that was kind of enthusiastic, really. He's the one that would have done it, but I don't think any of the others really had much interest. So they just went up on the roof and played a few songs. But it's still very good. Yeah, I mean, I, I recommend the documentary. Yeah. Question was, um, Darlene would like to know what started your passion for researching the Beatles. Oh, wow. Uh, well, I've always been into, I, I teach American and British history, and uh, I'm always interested in sort of uh, popular culture and cultural sort of history, social history. And so it's really from that angle. I was just interested, really, first of all, I wrote a book which was about the, uh, the British view of America and how they sort of like saw America from uh, the World War II onwards. And I wanted to write something that was kind of like a mirror image to that, what America thought of Britain. And then I kind of thought, well, it was 19, sorry, it was 2013 I was doing this. There was a lot on the, on the media about the Beatles and the Ed Sullivan show. I thought, why don't I just do it about America and the Beatles? And then I thought, too big a topic, I'll narrow it down and I'll do about Chicago and the Beatles. So it was really as a historical, so I'm interested in them as a social phenomenon. You know, I like their music, but I also like many others as well. You know, so, but yeah, I mean, it's not because I'm a diehard, you know, Beatles fan from the age of one. I like the Beatles, but I, I, I'm interested in them as a social phenomenon and a cultural phenomenon. I think that's, if that answers the question. I think so. Yeah. Um, I have another one. Francisco wants to know, is it real that the Beatles ate at Margie's? Okay, now that's a controversial story. And the reason being is most people would say, yes, okay, I am skeptical. Okay, and they'll tell you what the story is. They're, they're, in 1965, they played at White Sox Park. And after that, they uh, uh, stepped into Margie's, which is, are you all familiar with Margie's ice cream parlor? It's in, uh, uh, where is it now? Western and Armitage. So is that what you call uh, Bucktown area? That sort of area, you know where, it, that sort of area. Anyway, and it's still there, Margie's is still there. And you could, uh, basically what they did, allegedly, they went in there, they met the owner, they had some ice cream, and then they got back in the limousine. They had some girls with them, I should say as well. And then they got back in the limousine, then went off to their hotel. And the reason we, we know that is because the owner mentioned it in the late 80s. And he meant, she mentioned, sorry, she mentioned it in a newspaper article. And then it was also mentioned again in the 90s in the reader. And so the reason why I'm skeptical is because there's no evidence. There's no photographs from the occasion. There's no autographs from the occasion. Wouldn't you think they would have got a photograph? Or maybe not. And some people say, well, not many people had cameras at that time, which is true. You kind of guess they would have signed something, wouldn't you? you know? And then, of course, the other reason is that nobody else mentions it. They had other people on the tour, other photographers, groups, writers, journalists, none of them mention it. And then lastly is, why did it wait 25 years to even mention it in a newspaper? So I'm sorry, anybody that wants to believe that story, you know, I'm not saying it never happened. I'm not, I haven't got that sort of evidence. The, the reason why people think, or I think it might have happened, is because if you actually look at the route they took from, the, from White Sox Park up to O'Hare, it does actually pass there. It's not that far out of the way. You know, it, it is doable, that route. And then the other reason why I think it's doable is be, before they went to, allegedly went to Margie's, uh, they're all interested in American popular culture. You know, they loved uh, Americana. And that afternoon, they asked a promoter's son if they could borrow some of his comics because they loved American comics. He never got them back. You know? 
you take, yeah, I'm, I'm tearing up thinking about it. He still gets teared up about it. Where are my clients, he says, every day when he wakes up. But anyway, in terms of why I say that, that means that they were interested in American culture. They would have been interested in an ice cream shop, especially an old fashioned one like that. So it is a doable, it's not something outlandish, but I just wish there was more evidence. That's the point, really. I think I did, uh, I think there's one more here, Dean, for it. Yeah. On the topic of uh, stories or rumors, did you ever hear the story about um, there was a capital records distribution company in Nile, uh, which is the Northwest yep. River? Did you ever hear about their relationship with the Flickr cover album? Yeah, so I know there are very few copies in existence. Yeah. But supposedly some of them came from that location that they were, you know, ordered to be destroyed, but some people not destroyed them. Yeah. I didn't know that there was actually in Niles that they did that. But I do, yeah, obviously. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't know either. But I grew up that far right. there, and that was always kind of a local yeah. story. Yeah, I mean it could be true because obviously they did actually destroy the the the, the, the what they did is they, they had a record, you know, uh, ready to be released. And there was a bit of backlash about the cover. And so therefore they replaced the cover. And you, you could be right, it could have happened around here, but it also could have happened there. I'm not 100% certain where they actually, you know, produced them and then dismantled them, but it could be true. There's so many stories about the Beatles and uh, not only Chicago, but elsewhere that I, I found that don't hold water, I'm, I'm afraid to say. And, but anyway, yeah. I remember I was in the record store in Niles. Yeah. The day they released the uh, the album, I had yeah. it in my hand, put the butcher cover. No. And I did. And I said, well, I have money, I'll buy this tomorrow or something. And of course, the next day it's gone. Oh, uh, you've just let $20,000 go through your fingers there. <laughs> that, Come on, this is what a, a, a mid copy. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But what I want to say real quickly was yeah. regarding the uh, Jim Jackson documentary. Yeah. Uh, the fabulous thing about that documentary mm. is that it changed our whole concept of how the ending really was. Right. Mm. All we had to go by prior to that was let it be the film. Yeah. And you've got that scene with George and Paul. And yeah. Just saying, I'll play it any way you want. And yeah. Fresh, oh, nothing but funny. But it wasn't really like that. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're hooping around like crazy. They're yeah. having fun. And it's like, wow, it wasn't so bad. After all. No, I'm you're so right. I'm glad you did that. It really did. It was a different insight. Yeah, but I must say, even in the original film, the Let It Be one, I didn't think that scene was that big a deal. No, it did you know? Even in the original film, you know, and now they put more context to it, it looks even less of a big deal. Exactly. You know, but, but the great thing for us boomers that watched it, it was, um, those of us, you know, yeah. who had our band back then. Yeah. Uh, for us to watch that film and see them creating those songs. Yeah, there, that was amazing. Changing lyrics, changing yeah. Changes, like wow, this it was just phenomenal. Yeah, project. wasn't it Get Back when Paul McCartney was it Get Back he did there, wasn't it on the, the documentary? Well, well, he did it from the beginning. Then yeah. he did Get Back, yeah. Paul yeah, McCartney. It's it was was quite amazing. So get back yeah. Song. Yeah. Actually more interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Was a yeah, exactly. But, uh, About immigration, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Right. But to watch that uh, was just fabulous. And I watched every second of that and listened to every word that they said. Yeah. My brother Paul was not a musician said. Oh, I had to fast forward a lot of it. I said, oh, I didn't fast forward any of it. No, I didn't. I watched it all, of course. But I think it is for a certain audience. You've got to be yeah, fair. But yeah, it is. You know. But I must say, the star of the show for me was Heather. Heather. Paul McCartney's daughter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, when she came onto the documentary, I thought it really, she really helped the whole sort of oh, like scene. Really and yeah, and Billy Preston right. when he came there. And I think there is a difference between, they first played at Twickenham, which is like this horrible movie yeah, set place. Yeah. And then they moved to this new studio on Abbey, uh, not on Abbey Road, sorry, on the uh, Apple uh, building. And so, the, it, you know, I could see that why there would be two different sort of Let It Be's with it. You know? yeah, but, but Lennon really comes off as... Better than silly. I thought. He comes off very silly. Yeah. And but gentle. He comes across very gentle, I thought. He does. Yeah. Uh, McCartney comes off as much more creative. Very creative. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, allegedly at that time, uh, uh, John was indulging with Yoko in certain substances. But uh, but yeah, I I, I thought actually uh, John came across quite well in the sense of he seemed a lot more gentle than this sort of like angry man that a lot of people imagine him to be. You know. And they all seem to be having fun. Yeah, they all seem to be having fun. Yeah. But it gave you a real different, different concept. Yeah. Yeah. It's great for me. I 
no i did i liked it as well definitely yeah i could i could sit through easily six seven hours yeah but uh, okay anybody yeah why don't you uh do the commercial for your book <laughs> okay hold on a minute i'll do the commercial hello everybody <laughs> now you've been listening to my talk and you're probably saying to yourself wouldn't you like to know more about this subject more in depth and wouldn't you like to buy a book that i've signed personally with my own pen well you can do it today because I'm going to sign these books, and if you want a copy, they're a bargain, $15. Yeah, in the shops, $20. Here, signed copy, $15. Those at home, hopefully you can buy them from the museum. But we'll see. Was that good enough? Uh, we give Dr. Lyons one more. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you.